All right, very good. Good morning, everyone. I think it's about time to get started. This is Mark Arnold, I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing with Zap Surgical. Welcome and thanks to everyone for joining us today for what is our third webinar in a series of 10 over 10 weeks. So as part of that, being the third talk, if I can get the slides to advance, stand by. Being the third talk, we have seven more talks in store for you over the next seven weeks. So I encourage everyone to go to the URL you see in the upper right hand corner there, srs-webinars.com to see the other talks that we have in store for you. And at the same time through the site, you can find links to view recordings of our previous webinars in the series. So one last item of business before we get started, if you'd like to submit any typewritten questions at any point today, you can do that using the Q&A button there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And time permitting, at the end of both presentations, our panelists will field those questions. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. John Adler. Dr. Adler is the CEO and co-founder of Zap Surgical and also Professor Emeritus of Neurosurgery and Radiation Oncology at Stanford University. Dr. Adler, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank uh, Zap Surgical for hosting uh, this, uh, what has been a very lively series. And uh, I also have to give a shout out to COVID-19 because I guess without it, we <laughs> wouldn't be talking today. So uh, welcome all of you from around the world. So uh, today I'm excited to uh, introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, the topic is going to be radio surgery versus surgery for vestibular schwannoma. Uh, we have some leading lights in the field. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Michael McDermott. Uh, Mike is uh, Chief uh, Medical Executive, Miami Neuroscience Institute, and a professor of both neurosurgery and translational medicine at Florida International University, which are new titles for him as well as, uh, uh, I guess he's still a uh, professor at UCSF Emeritus. Um, following uh, his presentation of surgery, and while Mike is very well known in radiosurgical circles, he's uh, also a rather accomplished skull-based surgeon and brings, I think, a unique perspective, but today he's gonna talk very much about surgery. And uh, Mike is paired with uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Alex Mosvich, uh, Alex hails from the Munich Cyberknife Center, is all, where he is also a, a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Munich. So without further ado, I invite uh, Mike to show us how good surgery for vestibular schwannoma is done. Okay, thank you, uh, John. And um, you see my title slide there. Next slide is my disclosure slide. No, no relationships with any uh, radio surgery company. Next slide. Uh, my objectives today are to make some general comments about vestibular schwannoma based on 30 years of surgical experience. And then I'm really going to discuss algorithms for management of patients with medium to large vestibular schwannomas, review some of the past experience and publications from uh, UCSF, and then review the recent literature on surgery and outcomes for uh, vestibular schwannoma and acoustic neuroma as a prelude to Alex's talk about the alternative form of treatment, namely radiosurgery. Next slide. So I think it goes without saying in the modern world that all, not all vestibular schwannomas or benign skull-based tumors for that matter need surgery immediately after diagnosis. Uh, the aims for the treat, surgical treatment of vestibular schwannomas as well as radiosurgical treatment are one, tumor control, two, preservation of normal facial function, and three, if possible, preservation of hearing. Surgery still remains the primary form of treatment as of a publication in 2015 utilizing surveillance epidemiology and end results as published by the Mayo Clinic, uh, where the primary treatment was surgery in 48% of patients, radiosurgery in 24, and simple observation in 29%. Now, surgeons know this, but the best operating environment for microsurgery in the subarachnoid cisterns and around the CP angle is when there's been no prior treatment. The next 
worst or next next worst environment is prior radio surgery or radiotherapy. Worse than that is prior microsurgery. And the least favorable operating environment is prior surgery and prior radiotherapy or radiosurgery. Um, I used to tell patients whether they selected or we together selected surgery as a form of treatment that radiosurgery could be used for recurrence after surgical treatment um, and, and vice versa. If the patient had radiosurgery, that surgery could be used to salvage failure or tumor growth and the outcome in both situations can be good. Um, John and I have been around long enough to remember the transition between uh, fear-mongering about radiosurgery to the practical realities with long-term follow-up and the extremely low incidence of either secondary tumors or malignant degeneration of the treated tumor such that the one of the key aims is preservation of facial nerve function for uh, quality of life and uh, cosmesis so that the shift over the last 30 years has been has gone away from gross total resection at all costs to uh, a more balanced conservative approach with attempted um, near total resection or subtotal resection uh, and follow that with observation or uh, radio surgery. Next slide. Um, the one thing I'm, I'm not going to speak that much about is um, hearing. As I mentioned, one of the aims for any form of treatment for these tumors is, is tumor control, preservation of facial function, and then if at all possible, preservation of hearing. In a UCSF publication by Chagru in 2011, uh, we noted that those patients with documented tumor growth of more than 2.5 millimeters per year lost hearing at a faster rate than those with slower growth rates. And that overall in a series of 998 patients operated by either middle fossa or retrosigmoid approach, overall the hearing preservation rate was only 52%, although the middle fossa group had a higher hearing preservation rate than retrosigmoid, and we know that that's largely related to size. Um, I would say that a disruptive approach or uh, consideration was that of Jean Regis with this article you can see here advocating a proactive radial surgery um, for patients with intracanalicular vestibular schwannomas an attempt to improve hearing outcome long term and you can see his data in a non-randomized uh, patient population that at three four five years the hearing preservation rate seemed to be better in patients who had proactive uh, radio surgery. It's it's interesting to note in the review of the one of the Chagru papers from UCSF uh, that it was on average um, about 11 years from the onset of um, from the time of diagnosis to the onset of loss of hearing in patients with intracanalicular tumors who are simply observed. So um, there and there's other data uh, from European centers that will be coming out shortly that shows that in a um, uh, government-controlled healthcare system where every patient was seen in the same center, that only about 22% of uh, vestibular schwannomas that were diagnosed by imaging grew in a follow-up period of, of seven years. Next slide. So uh, this algorithm is as a prelude to uh, the discussion of the larger tumors, but Alex was asking me previously what our management strategy had been at UCSF for small vestibular schwannomas. And it is basically a breakdown like this. If the patients had normal hearing, we did nothing. We observed the patients with short interval scans, six months times two, and then once every year thereafter with an audiogram every six months because tumor progression can be manifest by either imaging enlargement of the tumor or decline in hearing. But if there's no tumor growth and the audiogram is stable, then we continue observation. If the patient has documented growth and or a hearing that's worse than what we call 50-50, meaning speech response threshold greater than 50 decibels and discrimination score less than 50%, then we consider treatment. At diagnosis, if the patient initially has worse or non-useful hearing or disabling vestibulopathy, those are 
considerations for treatment, which include radiosurgery or microsurgery. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows a paper from University of Cincinnati, one of our current UCSF faculty, Phil Theodosopoulos, and does surgery still remain a viable treatment option for small vestibular schwannomas? Um, you can see that table three shows that the overall useful hearing preservation rate uh, is still only 36%. If you look at the surgical approach, and, and this is somewhat important, is the um, uh, vestibulopathy. You can see a high percentage, 93% of patients in table four have relief of their disequilibrium and vestibulopathy. So if you have a patient who's in big trouble with a relatively frequent vertigo, um, a surgical removal is a, a good option for these patients. And as with anything, whether it's a sural nerve biopsy or a operation for an acoustic neuroma, there's a set of complications to go with any surgery. Next slide. Now, if we look at another paper from the UCSF group, this was basically a meta-analysis, and this was evaluating the morbidity other than facial and uh, audio-vestibular. Uh, there were 6,200 tumors greater than 25 millimeters, so greater than 25 would uh, be a medium-sized tumor. Uh, with surgical treatment, there was still a mortality, 0.2%. Morbidity was 22%. And the most common problem, as expected, was CSF leaks in 8.5% overall. But for the medium and large tumors, those greater than 25 uh, millimeters, you can see that there's a significant difference compared to the smaller tumors in terms of the rate of vascular injury and neurologic deficit and infections. Uh, those complications being higher, the bigger the tumor. Next slide. So our management algorithm for the medium and large size tumors is that if patients are symptomatic, new, they're either newly diagnosed or with documented growth, have evidence on imaging of mass effect, have evidence on physical exam of cerebellar dysfunction, ataxia, hearing loss, trigeminal neuropathy or neuralgia, those would be patients that we would consider uh, attempted surgical removal. Uh, please note that there are prior publications showing that for those patients with compressive trigeminal neuropathy or, or neuralgia, they do better after microsurgery than radiosurgery. Now, the goals that we review with the patient are, you know, we're not trying to take out the whole tumor anymore because we want to preserve facial function. So we're looking for confirmation of diagnosis, um, removal of mass effect to improve cerebellar function, and we don't give any promises on hearing given the um, medium and large size of these tumors. Next slide, please. Um, considerations for the surgeon, as with any tumor, patient factors, age, expectations of the patient, desires of the patient's hearing status, um, we don't guarantee. And then we've got to look at the comorbidities. Patients with cardiovascular or respiratory disease have higher complication profile in the post-operative period. Some patients are afraid of radiation therapy. And even though you provide them with all the information in the risks and benefits discussion, uh, we'll still want to advocate for uh, surgical treatment. Uh, tumor factors that affect outcome are obviously tumor size. And we're, now we're talking medium and large tumors. Uh, the presence of cerebellar and or brainstem edema, just like with a cerebellar pontine angle meningioma, you know that you're not going to be able to remove all of this tumor at the interface between cerebellum, brainstem, and tumor without causing increased neurologic deficit. Um, I think experienced surgeons would know that uh, cystic tumors tend to be what we would call sticky, and um, most of the mass effect in those cases is related to the cysts and not the solid tumor component. Next slide. So what about medium and large tumors? Another paper from Phil at the University of Cincinnati, and we're talking about Coos grade three, grade four uh, tumors reaching the brainstem surface, deforming the brainstem and or shifting the fourth ventricle. Uh, when you have an experienced surgeon, you can get very good outcomes. Look at the facial nerve outcomes in even grossly totally resected tumors. Small numbers, but 82% of patients had a good facial nerve outcome, which is an outstanding result. Uh, tumor control and limited uh, short-term follow-up 
um, shows what you would expect. Tumor controls bit better when the tumor is completely removed than when it's subtotally removed. Next slide. Uh, these are three examples of surgery that I did in the last six months uh, with the planned strategy of uh, near total or subtotal removal in order to preserve facial nerve function. Um, top, a small remnant on the left that we wait three months to see if that will crenate down and present a better radiosurgical target. If it doesn't, it's still a linear um, dispersed uh, tumor volume. We'll wait another three months. Uh, but plan usually to treat these patients at six months with adjuvant radiotherapy. Middle example there, large cyst on the back, uh, small residual um, tumor component, and then a, on the bottom, a, a large cystic tumor. And all these patients had uh, grade one or two House Brackman facial nerve outcomes. Next slide. So what's the um, literature on facial nerve outcomes uh, and tumor control rates as a degree of resection? This is a multi-institutional study that was published uh, two years ago. Uh, the lead author was Rob Jackler from Stanford University. Uh, there were 73 patients with a mean tumor diameter of 3.3 centimeters. So these are CUS three and four tumors. Gross total resection in the minority of patients. So here the strategy, compare this these results on resection with the paper published by Phil from the University of Cincinnati 10 years earlier. Strategy has completely changed. So now the majority of the patients have near total or subtotal resection. 78% of these patients had adjuvant radiotherapy um, and 36% of these needed salvage treatment. You can see the House Brackman results on the bottom. And if you look at um, the graph in in t bar histogram table B, if you add up the facial nerve palsy rates uh, for House Brackman three and three to six, um, it's over um, forty percent. So, um, you know the the morbidity associated with removal of large tumors is not trivial. Next slide, please. What's the long term risk of recurrence after gross total resection? This is a paper from the Mayo Clinic group showing that even with gross total resection, if you follow the patients for 20 years, similar to parasagittal meningiomas as published by Teat Matheson, the recurrence rate's about 50% at 20 years post-treatment. Uh, again, not surprisingly, if there's residual tumor, um, the, there's a higher rate of recurrence and the, and the tumor recurs at a shorter interval. So this, uh, for me, the bottom um, Kaplan-Meier curve would support adjuvant radiotherapy following surgery uh, with planned subtotal removal rather than simply observing the patient. Next slide, please. Uh, we mentioned uh, patient factors. What about age in a matched cohort group? Again, from the Mayo Clinic, um, showing patients um, who are the over the age of 70, and there's a trend towards uh, an increased incidence of uh, cardiac events if you're over the age of 70 postoperatively, but not reaching significance in a trend, much less so of the need for additional surgery and all the other parameters are surgically related and not age related. Um, but you'd notice that the patients over the age of 70 after three years appear to have um, a higher rate of recurrence than patients who are younger, not sure what the underlying biology is for that. Next slide, please. That's always said from individuals who are not radiosurgery practitioners or not familiar with the results that if you have radiosurgery for your vestibular schwannoma and it recurs, that your surgery is guaranteed to be um, pretty, you know, guaranteed to be problematic or a quote disaster. You're guaranteed to have a facial nerve palsy, but that's not true. I remember operating with one of my neurotology colleagues and commenting as I was taking out the intracanalicular uh, portion of the tumor saying, you know, I don't think this is um, any more difficult than if the patient had never had prior treatment. His response was, I think it's easier because it's less vascular. So there you go. Uh, here are 10 patients from UCSF in a um, nine year period with prior uh, radial surgery in eight out of 10 fractionated treatment and two out of 10 gross total resection of all the tumor in 70% near total and 20% uh, 
um, and subtotal in one, but the facial nerve outcomes were excellent in eight out of 10 patients. Nobody had a complete facial nerve palsy, uh, but two patients had some obvious weakness and incomplete eye closure. So our conclusion was, this, was that salvage surgery after prior radio surgery is safe and effective. Next slide, please. What are the national trends recently as a review in this surgical management vestibular schwannomas 2008-2016? You can see the number of operations, the distribution of surgical approaches. Uh, there's an increased use of retrosigmoid um, approaches and that's obvious for the surgeons because it takes less time, it's simpler. And if you're aiming for subtotal resection, you don't have to drill the internal auditory canal from behind, but rather just make sure you preserve the uh, facial nerve and the complications did not seem to be related to the surgical approach. Next slide, please. Obviously, some of these results from very experienced groups like Mayo Clinic, Stanford, UCSF, others, many to name, is that uh, there is an effect of both practitioner and institutional volume on surgical outcomes. This holds true for head and neck cancer, for GI cancer, for uh, aneurysm surgery, AVM surgery, et cetera. Uh, and in this study, the uh, authors designated a low volume center of one to six cases per year and a high volume center of greater than 31 cases. And the high volume centers had improved metrics in terms of uh, lower incidence of facial palsy, lower complication, uh, lower short, uh, short um, um, should, should be discharges, not outcomes, but short term um, and discharges and non-routine discharges. So experience does make a difference. And as Dr. Leonard Malice used to say, um, experience is 300 cases when it comes to uh, vestibular schwannomas. Um, I think this is my second to last slide. Oh, what does the current neurosurgical literature recommend? Well, the, this is the um, uh, abstract from the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, uh, WNS, CNS, uh, joint section on tumors, surgical resection for patients with vestibular schwannomas. I won't go through all the questions, but there's hardly any, there's no level two or level one evidence supporting one method of treatment over the other. So to sum up, um, surgery still has a role to play, especially for medium and, and large tumors. I think over the last 30 years, the management has changed. Our, uh, our effort is to make the diagnosis, get the patient under trouble, not to try and remove all the tumor, but to preserve facial nerve. Uh, decisions about the risk profile need to be honest. So the facial nerve weakness rate after surgery is 20% at one week, 40% at two weeks, and probably somewhere in the order of five to 10% at one year. And even with gross total resection, um, this is not necessarily curative in long-term follow-up. Thank you. Hello. Uh Great, Mike, really great, great. Covered a lot of ground and uh, uh, we'll have some questions at the end. And I wanna make sure the audience is aware of the fact that bottom of your um, Zoom in, uh, window, you'll see an opportunity to ask questions. And so there's a QA button. If you have any, please click and you'll have an opportunity to ask, write a question out. Uh, next, uh, Alex Mosevich is gonna show us how uh, in his experience, uh, an incredible range of acoustic schwannomas can be treated uh, with uh, radio surgery. So Alex, take it away. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, thanks, Mike. This was an excellent presentation. Um, even for me, again, interesting to see all these uh, surgical data in a very compact format drawn together. I like in my talk to challenge the surgeons a little bit. Next slide, please. Uh, I like to show uh, some interesting, hopefully interesting cases for you. That's a, would say, large or middle-sized uh, vestibular schwannoma, but probably 90% of the surgeons in the world uh, would uh, recommend to treat with a surgical resection. You see on the left-hand side, the initial situation, the patient just experienced some uh, hearing deficit and did not want to undergo a surgical resection. You see the typical appearance after a year or so with this interstitial tumor regression, and then after another five years, you see that the tumor can hardly be detected anymore. The trigeminal nerve is seen again, and this is quite a fortunate outcome. Next, please. 
So the incidence seems to rise. Um, I just checked an hour ago if I could get, could get any more up-to-date data, but I couldn't find it. Still, people believe incident is one to two of uh, to one hundred thousand uh, people in population. I think it's it's much more because we see so many vestibular schwannomas currently because of the increased capabilities of MRI imaging, but uh, there is no real data in the literature which proves that. Next, please. So I was asked uh, to present our data, which is probably the largest uh, published radiosurgical series so far of over 1,000 patients. Most of these patients were uh, primary treatments without any uh, tumor surgery before or radiation treatment before. And the median follow-up uh, was 3.6 years and up to 12.5 years. Next, please. Local control over time. Um, Long-term local control, 10 years, was about 90%. Uh, seems to be similar to the bigger series of the surgical colleagues, what uh, Mike just described. So this um, is obviously a comparable data. Um, next slide, please. People who received surgery before and have a remnant or recurrency seem to do slightly worse, even though we treat these tumors with a little higher dose, but nevertheless, um, as generally in, in I think, oncolog oncological surgery, um, often pretreated tumors do a little worse than primary tumors. Next, please. Our statistics, uh, the prognostic factors uh, for local control, as I just said, surgery before, or also tumor volume are negative predictors. Uh, similar to surgery, the bigger tumors do a little worse than the medium and small sized lesions. Next, please. So the question arises in, in clinical practice every day, do I need to treat every vestibular schwannoma? And um, this seems not to be the case. We try to follow up the patients at the beginning as best as possible. If hearing is stable, if there's no, and there's no improvement in any neurological deficits and uh, the tumor is not growing significantly, there's a good reason to wait and scan in the initial run. That's an example here, 17 years follow-up, and you see there was no growth at all. If this patient has still um, a, a normal neurological function, there is no need for any kind of treatment. Next, please. Sometimes they can even regress spontaneously. So if we would have treated this patient, we would have been quite satisfied with the treatment result after seven years, I guess. But you see here on the right side, the tumor did regress naturally without any additional treatment. So that's something which can happen, it's rare. But um, people ask you uh, in, in your outpatient clinic, can the tumor go back on its own? Um, I tend to say this is very rare, but sometimes we see that and I think that's an, quite an interesting example for that. Next, please. Um, we also tend to say that we do six months to 12 months of follow-up evaluations in the beginning. And we believe that the tumor growth is about one to two millimeters per year, but this is not always the case. Some of these tumors uh, tend to grow pretty fast. We don't have a good explanation for that, but that's an interesting example here from uh, 2009 to uh, 2011, this tumor significantly increased in size and uh, luckily uh, I think we catch this tumor before it got even bigger and uh, so we could still do a safe radiosurgical approach in this situation. Next please. A little um, backward um, statistics. Uh, we were treating our vestibular schwannomas a couple of years ago with a gamma knife system and there's still the discussion um, in the literature and also at the meetings, um, if there would be a difference in accuracy between a frame-based and a frameless system. And that's a little statistics here, which shows that technical accuracy is uh, very much the same for gamma knife system or cyber knife system. So from the technologically te technological standpoint, there should be no difference. Next, please. 
and also from the dosimetry that's a comparable vestibular schwannoma on the right side, you see the dosimetry for the gamma knife and for the cyber knife. And I would argue it's pretty much the same. There is really no difference. And that's what we also experience in the clinical course. Next, please. Um, not every tumor in the cerebral pontine angle or in the, in the meatus must necessarily be a vestibular schwannoma. Um, that's an interesting case where we were a little skeptical because this patient approached with a facial palsy on the left side. So we did uh, screen the whole brain. Next slide, please. And we saw at the back of the lateral ventricle on the left side a little little lesion in the MRI. So we decided to do first six weeks early MRI control. Next, please. And so we saw the lesion there um, growing significantly. Next, please. And also the lesion in the meatus. Uh, next. Did grow and uh, so we sent this patient for surgery. And in the end, it was a, a cerebral um, lymphoma and not a vestibular schwannoma. So um, I think this was um, uh, an interesting case and that's very important to recognize that not all these needs necessarily are vestibular schwannomas and um, in this case the most the most obvious and the, 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 the factor which made us more skeptical was that uh, the facial palsy uh, primarily appeared and that's not the typical situation for a sporadic vestibular schwannoma. Next please. Go ahead. Yeah, these are clear surgical indications for us. These are tumors. Mike just described T4 tumors. The ventricle is displaced. I think there's no point in doing radius surgery in these tumors. So uh, the surgeons are really uh, in no way obsolete anymore, but um, we, we need to cooperate in these lesions. These are very good cases for partial tumor resection and then a following radiosurgical procedure uh, right at the nerves. Next, please. Uh, not all tumors do react uh, after one uh, radiosurgical uh, shot. That's a follow-up here from 2005 where the vestibular schwannoma was first treated with cyber knife. 2006 it got a little bigger, 2009 even bigger and uh, I think it's fair to say that after four years um, we, 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 can, we can tell the patient that this uh, was not a successful treatment. So the dis discussion comes up what are we going to do? Another radiosurgical procedure or surgery patient decided for another uh, radiosurgical shot. So we treated him in 2010. The second time, 2011, interstitial tumor regression coming up more, but still swelling, again, bigger. Of course, patients get very nervous then and believes, okay, even I got the two treatments, it's still not working. But then um, luckily 2013, the lesion regressed as we expected. And I must say, in our experience here, there are very, very rare situations that uh, two radiosurgical procedures are not successful for local control. Next, please. Uh, toxicity after radiosurgery. A trigeminal nerve is obviously dependent on the size of the lesion. The smaller tumors don't even reach the trigeminal nerve. The bigger ones um, always reach the nerve. And we found a toxicity of 2% in these cases. Next, please. The facial uh, nerve is the most uh, crucial nerve. And um, it's, it's fair to say from our data uh, that the risk for permanent facial toxicity after radiosurgery is well under 1%. And that's, I think, the most important information uh, for most patients to decide um, for what kind of uh, treatment they are. Uh, going for. Next, please. Um, hearing um, is something which is not always so easy to analyze. In our data, we did um, digitize all our angiograms and compared them to the contralateral healthy side. And uh, we found that after three years, about 50% of the patients have a reduction of the hearing function and 50% still hear the same level as before. I think that's relatively good. Um, in the American literature, 
Um, they have a little different approach to that. Um, they typically test for um, preservation of any testable hearing and use the uh, Robinson scale, but I think that's not um, so um, such a good information in general for hearing because a testable hearing, uh, any testable hearing doesn't really tell um, if you have um, a good enough hearing function in daily life. So um, I believe it's more, it's more, it's the better situation to do the angiograms and really compare them over time and particularly do a comparison to um, the healthy side because this will only give you the real net effect of your procedure. Next, please. Uh, a question often coming up, um, is there any induction of uh, secondary tumors by radiosurgery? I just briefly want to mention this uh, important paper of Bruce Pollock. Uh, he uh, wrote together all his experience of uh, 25 years of uh, radiosurgery treatments. Next, please. And he could um, document there was no radiation-induced secondary tumor in his uh, whole series. And uh, for us here, that's like the landmark paper, um, which gives the best information on this issue. Next, please. So to summarize, uh, radiosurgery is very effective and well tolerable by the patient. It's comparably easy. Nowadays, uh, we need about, about 20 to 25 minutes um, for um, cyber knife treatment in almost all cases. In our center, at least, it's a single fraction approach. So that's um, very easy to compensate for the patient in their daily life. Typically, um, they take one or two days off and then they are uh, back to work on day three. Some um, are very motivated. They even try to do it in the, in the lunch break, but I think that's a little exaggerated. So overall, two to three days and um, you are back to action. Next, please. Trigeminal nerve, as I said, 2% uh, toxicity depending on the tumor site. Next, please. Facial nerve, less than 1% um, for permanent facial toxicity in primary SRS lesions. The, it's slightly higher um, in tumors which recur um, after radiosurgery or after surgery, which is quite obvious and uh, we tend to give data above one to two percent for toxicity in not primary uh, vestibular schwannomas. Next please. And the vestibular nerve that's something which is very difficult um, to test I think and there's not good data out there and I think we all need to think about that and work a little better with our ENT colleagues uh, to find a better estimation about the vestibular nerve function. For many patients, vestibular uh, nerve problems are the most um, difficult things to compensate for. Um, if, the, if the hearing is not that well, that's typically well tolerable, but the strong vestibular problem um, is hard to cope. And in many cases, we don't have a good answer here, I think. Next, please. Cochlear nerve, what I said before, 50% um, decline, some form of decline after three years, which is a big range from uh, hearing, you know, one step less up to uh, complete um, hearing loss on this ear. But this is uh, very rare and only happens um, when the hearing is already pretty bad um, before treatment. Okay, that's my slides so far, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. It goes to show that if you treat a thousand acoustic neuromas with radio surgery, you can learn something. So good stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we're not getting a lot of questions, but we got one great question, and uh, it's something that I was going to delve into myself. Um, and this is a question for both of you guys, and it's a, regarding the, the occasional acoustic neuroma that grows after radio surgery. Uh, so, question, and I'll leave it to both of you, is when to do further treatment. And if you decide that you're going to do radiosurgery again, what kind of dose do you use the second time around? I think I know the answer, but let's start with Mike. When, would, when do you treat 
When do you do a second treatment for a growing acoustic neuroma? Yeah, that that is a really difficult um, uh, question to answer because both Alex just showed this, and then Jean Regi has said that it can occur up to seven years post treatment mm. that the tumor finally begins to envelope uh, after showing the initial swelling phenomenon. I did have a patient uh, with exactly that, but it didn't, I didn't wait seven years, but it was five years. And the tumor kept growing slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, the patient didn't want to have any additional treatment, uh, which was a good decision on her part because she suffered a cardiac arrest uh, after that five-year scan and had an implanted defibrillator, so she had to have CTs thereafter. Um, but after that event, the the next CT scan we did with contrast, the tumor uh, had decreased by about 30 to 40% in volume. Um, so it, in her case, it took five years, and I was a bit nervous, but the patient actually made the right choice and said, I feel fine, I don't want to do anything. Well, what's your threshold? What's your threshold? Um, as long as the patient doesn't have clinical symptoms okay. that are you know, related to brainstem or cerebellar dysfunction. But then don't you lose your shot at a second course of radio surgery? Yeah. What happens but when their tumor comes back, you know, three centimeters? Oh, okay. Well, it, well, yeah, then obviously you want it up, up to a point, as you say, size would be the limit. I wouldn't let it keep growing beyond 2 cm in the cerebellar pontine angle. And if we decide that we, you know, the literature on retreatment of vestibular schwannomas with radiosurgery after failed prior radiosurgery is scant because most of the tumors don't fail. Um, so if, I think the Pittsburgh group and Jean Regi are the only ones that I'm aware of, and I may be wrong, that have published a significant number of patients. And the treatment's the same, same dose. If there's no hearing, you can go to 13 gray instead of 12 or 12.5 but it's the same dose as before. So Alex, yeah, you know, even you must have a failure or two. Yeah. What do you treat and at what dose do you, do you back off in any dose second time around? Okay, one, one thing is when the tumor is really growing, as I showed in my example over years, and that's something between three to five years, if it's getting every six months larger and hearing is going down and we analyzed that, so the, the, if the hearing is going down significantly in parallel, then um, the, the risk for a recurrency or not functional primary treatment is very high. So that's something we take into account. If hearing is still good, we might even wait longer and go to the, up to the seven years Jean Regis is um, recommending. But if hearing is going down in the meantime, there is a, a, a high risk um, that this is uh, not the normal situation what you anticipate. And uh, we treat our primary tumors uh, with 13 gray and we treat the recurrencies with 13.5, so a little more. You, you actually treat more the second time around. Okay. And then well, I. It, it might, makes no sense to go less because if the dose didn't really work the first time, you know, why should you go lower? And I, yep. I know how anti-fractionation you are, so I'm assuming you would never, is our role for, you know, escalating dose with fractionation. No, I mean, uh, it, I, no. I think it also depends on the time course of, or the growth rate. So if the, let's say you're out three years post-treatment and the tumor starts to grow more than 2.5 millimeters uh, a year, then uh, surgery is also still an option, as I showed, because, you know, there, there's, I think there's about 14 cases in the literature of degeneration. And sometimes, I think, as Alex showed, the um, diagnosis is incorrect. So you thought you were treating an acoustic neuroma. It turns out it's a ependymoma, the CP angle from, from the region of frame and Lushka. So it's really rare. So I think the growth rate af as after radiosurgery will dictate what you would do next. Okay, well, I personally had a patient through whom I threw the towel in. I figure it was actually a recurrent tumor after microsurgery. And six, seven years out, the tumor was growing and clearly I thought out of control. I told, sent it back to the microsurgeon to so get this removed. And for some reason he said, no, I'm not going. He didn't tell me about it till about 10 years later. <laughs> and never went back and uh, I got a Rolex watch out of it. So. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I find it very 
for those in the audience, it is a tough, tough thing to decide when to, when to tr give more treatment or surgery to a patient uh, who's uh, seemingly failed. But it has never ceases to surprise me that even when you think you failed these cases in radio surgery, if you can find a way to wait long enough, they seem to involute. So yeah. And yeah. I think we understand why. So uh, I think we have at least one last question. So uh, I, I have others if we have time here. But uh, have you, any of you guys seen uh, uh, tumor hemorrhage of a sugar schwannoma, quote unquote, 18 months post radio surgery? I know I haven't, but maybe you have. No, no I've, I have not seen it post um, radio surgery clinically evident. I've seen it on initial presentation. We did look um, at the pathology of previously treated and then resected vestibular schwannomas, and there's a higher, and they had a pretty high incidence of intratumoral microhemorrhage. Uh, because of the vasculopathy associated with the radial therapy, but clinically not evident. I've never seen it. Um, I'm looking on the literature. There is a um, there are, when you when you do a literature search of acoustic neuroma and hemorrhage, you get 220 results. Um, but intratumoral hemorrhage is pretty rare. I would, I've never seen it. So for the member of the audience, it's uh, it's very very rare. Um, so let's talk about for a second uh, vestibular schwannoma of almost any size and vestibular symptoms mm. because it seems to me radio surgery has a lot of trouble in this domain. Yeah. So uh, how does that push you one way or the other? Alex, you're a major proponent of radio surgery, but in the patient who presents with a small to medium sized tumor and has bad uh, you know, uh, vestibular dysfunction, what do you do? Yeah, well, there are, there are cases where you have like a five millimeter intramural uh, intra uh, vestibular schwannoma, which gives horrible vestibular problems. And, um, you know, this needs to be evaluated very carefully. And um, I, I do uh, also tend to recommend, recommend in very, very serious cases to do the surgical resection, because if you, if you kill the vestibular nerve, uh, typically the patient is much better on the next day. I mean, as most people probably here know that the vestibular nerve is the only nerve of the, of the 12 uh, brain nerves, um, cranial nerves, which uh, can, where the, uh, the healthy side can compensate for the, um, for the bad side. So um, to, to kill the vestibular nerve in these situations, is a good thing and surgery can do this better than radio surgery. Um, I, would, I would say that, um, yeah, I think the literature, the paper that I showed of Philip Theodosopoulos showed that 93% of patients had relief of their vestibulopathy. But I, before I would consider with the example that Alex raised of a five millimeter inch canalicular tumor, I would consider um, medical therapy first. Um, so I would send that patient to my neurotologist, uh, evaluate them for consideration of gentamicin injection into the labyrinth. Um, and then neurosurgeons are not aware of this, but um, in full disclosure, my wife had a vestibular schwannoma treated with radiosurgery. And um, she had terrible trouble after the treatment and I sent her to my neurotologist and he made the diagnosis of vestibular migraine with vestibulopathy and recommended a, a dietary change and tried a medication call, which was one of the serotonin antagonists and she was cured. Wow. It was so dramatic that I invited him to give a presentation to the neurosurgery, neurosurgery group on vestibular migraine. And it's something you, I mean, it's the, the, the neurotologists know about it, but it's not common knowledge to the surgeon. So I would try medical therapy first, uh, even a short course of steroids if the vestibulopathy came on suddenly after uh, radiosurgical treatment. And then if all else failed and the patient was disabled, then yes, I would operate. Good for Coralie, I didn't know that story. Well, look, everybody, we've, uh, I think we've come to the end of our session. I want to thank all of you for 
joining us this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> uh, and I thank our two participants. Uh, I think for 15 minutes, we covered a lot of ground. And you can clearly tell we have experts speaking this morning because uh, the quality of and the conciseness of the arguments were just tremendous. So thank you all and uh, wish you a safe uh, COVID uh, pandemic lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.